All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 2017 Physics Regions from June 2017 of last year. I'm going to go through every single part, every single question of this exam. There are four parts to this. We're going to start with part A, but nevertheless, there are four parts, part A, part B1, part B2, and part C. Okay. Um, this part that we're going to start with, part A, is 35 multiple choice questions. The remaining parts have 15 multiple choice questions and the remaining 35 points to be earned in the free response section in part B2 and part C. And so we're going to begin with part A right here on this page. And number one, as you can see, will always be a question about scalars and vectors. Okay. And number one is asking about which unit is used for a vector quantity. So we got to remember the differences between scalars and vectors. Scalars have magnitude, and vectors have magnitude and direction. So you got to think about vectors as things that you could represent with arrows because they have magnitude and direction. And so some questions in the past, for number one in past exams, usually ask which one's a scalar, which one's a vector, or compare them, or pair them up and such. But this one's talking about units for their quantities. So we got to know what quantities are tied with these units. And so we start going choice by choice. Watts is for power, newtons is for force, kilograms for mass, and seconds is for time. Mass and time are scalars. You either have them or you don't. Do you have time? Do you have mass? You either have them or you don't. Power and force. Now, power is a scalar. I'm going to tell you right there. Because power is you either have power or you don't. It's tied with energy, and energy is also a scalar. Force, on the other hand, has direction. You can push and pull, and that kind of gives a sense of direction also. And forces, we usually represent with arrows, so that's a vector. So that's choice one. Number two. Now we're talking about displacement vectors with a magnitude of 20 meters. So the confusing thing is displacement vectors. Think of them as the result in the hypotenuse of a triangle. And we got to figure out which two quantities could give us the appropriate legs of a right triangle with a hypotenuse of 20. So we got to think to use Pythagorean theorem. And you know what? A strategy is to go through each of these choices. That's one strategy. Another strategy, actually, is to remember some Pythagorean triples. My favorite one to remember, and usually that's often asked, is the 3, 4, 5 triangle. You can also go up in multiples of them. So if you double that, you get 6, 8, 10. That's another triangle. You could triple it to get 9, 12, and 15. Or quadruple it, which you're going to see, as 12, 16, and 20. And you could prove it using Pythagorean theorem, and that's actually our answer. Choice 3, and I'm going to prove it to you in a moment. And voila, that's the answer. You can see that 12 and 16 make up the perpendicular legs to a resultant displacement vector of 20. And there you go for number two. Now number three tells about a hiker going south, west, and then north a certain distance. We're looking for the total distance. Okay, now distance and displacement are different. Okay, distance is your total path taken. That is what we're focusing on. Displacement is the straight line start to finish, and that's a vector. So this one's the vector, and the other one is the scalar. So we're looking at the scalar quantity of total distance. So all it is is 1 plus 3 plus 3, and that equals 7 kilometers, and that's our answer choice 4. All right, number 4 is asking through your standard calculation type of questions. Okay. So initial velocity slows to this final velocity in that time. We're looking for acceleration. So we got this, got that, that, and we're looking for this. You will get an answer of negative 2.5 meters per second squared. Now, is that negative useful? Yes, it's actually necessary. So this car is traveling east to begin with. And it's slowing down. So if you're traveling east and you're slowing down, that means something's pulling you 
west. And that's what the negative sign implicates, that the acceleration is going west. Oops, that's not the pen. It's right here. Okay, number five. We are on planet X, sorry. And we are looking for acceleration due to gravity on planet X. So it's not 9.81 because we are not on Earth. And it's simply just fg equals m times g solving for g. And that's 4 meters per second squared. Okay. It's choice 4. And then number 6 is another calculation kinematics question. The, very, the early part of the test is very kinematics heavy, guys. Okay. We've got these quantities. And you're solving for A. And then you will get 1.5 meters per second squared using this equation. You just plug it in. Um, and then there's no negative sign, none of the answer choices are reflecting direction. Since we're just going in a straight line, speeding up, and it's just choice two. There we go. Alright, number seven, an object starts at rest. So its initial velocity zero falls freely near the surface of planet P. So we're not using 9.81 as our acceleration. So we've got to figure that out, actually. The distance it falls is 40 meters, the time is 4 seconds, so that means we're going to use this equation. And you should get 5.0 meters per second squared as your answer, and that is choice 3. Okay. Now number 8. We have a block in equilibrium. That means all of these forces are equal and balanced. So that means our net force is zero newtons. And when that happens, we have no acceleration. That's what it means to be in equilibrium. Absolutely zero acceleration. Number nine is a very early number to start seeing light. But we're talking about reflection. Reflection means that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. But which angle are we using? We're using the angle in reference to this imaginary normal line that's perpendicular to the surface. So our angle of incidence is 60 degrees. Which means our angle of reflection is also 60 degrees, and that's choice 2. Okay. Number 10. Okay, that's just for you guys to remember. Electric field exerts an electrostatic force of this many newtons. On an electron, so the charge is actually implied to be this. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And we're looking for the electric field strength. And all it is is this equation, E equals Fe over Q. So whenever they say electron or proton, their charge is in elementary charges. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. If you don't remember that, that's on the front of the reference table with all those special important numbers you gotta use all the time. Anyway, you plug and chug, and you should get your answer to be about 9.4 times 10 to the fourth newtons per coulomb. Okay, and that's your answer when you plug it in, top and bottom. All right, number 11 is talking about a conservation of momentum type of problem, and this is an explosion type of scenario. So explosions meaning a force breaks apart the whole system into multiple objects. So it starts out as one object, and we know that because they're initially held together at rest, both carts, and then they shoot off in opposite directions because of the spring force, okay? And so after the spring is released, Cart B goes to the right and cart A goes to the left. Now, because they experience the same force, their change of momentum is going to be the same. Okay? 
So the total momentum before equals total momentum after, since they initially start together at rest, that's zero. Which means the momentum of both objects after the collision is going to be equal but opposite to each other. Equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Okay? So they're going to be proportional in that sense. So cart A, 70 kilograms, and we're solving for its velocity after the explosion. Mass B is 3 kilograms. I'm having a brain fart. Okay, 6 meters per second. Velocity of cart A is equal to 18 over 7, and this comes out to approximately 2.6 meters per second. Choice 4. Okay, number 12. Here we have something moving in a circular path, and we're looking for the direction of the net force. Okay, circular path meaning centripetal force. Centripetal force is always towards the center. That's the direction. Wherever you are, it's towards the center. Okay, so if you happen to be point B, it goes up here. If you're at point C, it's to the right. Point D is downward, and so point A is important to know because that's what we're asking about. And that's to the left. Number 13. The potential difference between the two points is 2 volts. Potential difference is the same as voltage. The energy required, so that's work, to move the charge. Oh, the work is what we're looking for. The charge is given to us as 8.0 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. This all comes from one equation. Voltage equals work over charge. 2 volts equals work over 8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Multiply that, and work is equal to this. Choice 2. It's simple as that.